Hello, 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 hello. Give me a shout out if you can hear me and also uh, see my screen here. And welcome back to another Z Classroom Live here on Twitch. So I got a few things to uh, cover today on some things. We've got some news for you guys. Uh, so the one thing I want to hit on first is that if you have had any issues with the licensing server, especially if you've had um, a subscription-based version of ZBrush going, we have released a patch. So 2020.1.4 is now available. And so if you just go over to zbrushcentral.com and click on this, this will take you to the information on that. And so if you have any licensing stuff happening or if your um, ZBrush has been experiencing some, uh, we had some reports of it crashing due to licensing. Uh, so we have released a update for uh, ZBrush here, and so that will be for ZBrush Core and also the full version of ZBrush. So you can just go to zbrushcentral.com and just click on this link here, and it'll take you to the information on how to upgrade your latest version to the latest version, and that should resolve those issues. So a bit of news there on that, and I'm still running a 2020.1.3 20, uh, for this stream today, but if you have subscription, it mainly affected uh, subscription uh, licensing, so definitely uh, you know, if you're having any issues, go over to Zero Central and get the update and see if that resolves any problems you have. Um, in addition to that, once again, we do have a trial of ZBrush and this will also be updated to the uh, latest version that I just mentioned. Uh, and so if you want to try ZBrush and know anyone that wants to experience ZBrush firsthand, you can definitely come to the trial page here and you can grab a copy and for 30 days you'll have an unrestricted version of ZBrush. It's gonna be the same one that I'm using here today. And so definitely you can try it out and then you can log into these streams here on Twitch and follow along and get a taste uh, for the software itself. Um, in addition to this, just wanna hit on some of the other brief things for Pixelogic here, is that we have uh, different ways to get into ZBrush. So to start off, we have subscription-based, we have single month and six month, and we also have perpetual licenses. Uh, if we've, you've ever bought ZBrush, we've always given free upgrades for the entire life of the product so far. So I bought ZBrush early, early on, and I've never had to pay anything extra. There's no yearly subscriptions, uh, no yearly service plans, and when the next version comes out with all its new bells and whistles and features, whatever they may be, um, you can get those upgrades uh, for free uh, if you have a perpetual license. In addition to this, we also have the core version of ZBrush, which is our lighter version of ZBrush here. And so this gets down to as low as $9.95 a month uh, for that subscription plan. And then we also have a perpetual license for that as well. And with both of those, uh, you can there's a purchase path where if you have core, you can upgrade to the full version of ZBrush. And we give you a discount on that as well. So a lot of ways to get into ZBrush, but the cheapest one is definitely to go to the trial here and try for 30 days, see if it's something you like, something you want to doing. And so for me, it opened up a lot of creativity in what I was doing for making games and stuff. So it was a huge change in terms of my creation process. And I've been sucked into it ever since. So it's <laughs> part of the reason why I'm here with you guys today. All right, so I'm gonna try to check chat here today when we go over some stuff. And today what we're gonna be doing is I'm going to be working on a little uh, kind of concept building thing here. So we're gonna be going through and using some Zmodeler techniques to generate a quick little design like this. And then we're gonna take those and maybe use some ray mesh and some other things um, to get kind of a a little building. So this is a very simple kind of project. So if you're new to ZBrush or you just want to some, you know, start off easily into the Zmodeler process, this is going we're going to go over that in the stream here today. So hopefully you won't be overwhelmed and then uh, you can end up creating, you know, a little image like this at the end. And this was rendered in KeyShot too. All right. So if you have any other questions or stuff, um, hit me up in the chat. I see some people uh, thanking for uh, these kind of instructional stuff. So I appreciate that. Glad to hear that they are worthwhile. And then we will get into ZBrush here. So I'm bringing back my keyboard today to, where are you at keyboard? Let me find you. I think I found a better little place for it. I'm gonna stick it right here. I think they'll be out of the way somewhat while I'm doing this. All right, so the first thing we're gonna do for these uh, 
kind of building that I want to set here is I want to make my first basic shape. And this is basically that little kind of structure that's kind of a oval type uh, thing that has a hollow surface in it. And so when you start ZBrush up, uh, you're going to be greeted with Lightbox, and that is what this is here. And you can toggle this open and close by clicking this icon here or pressing comma on your keyboard. And in Lightbox here, if I go to the Project tab, I want to scroll over and I want to locate this primitives file. So I'm just going to come over here and double click that. And then this will now load that primitive file in. And this is a ZBrush project file. So what a project file is, is it contains multiple tools. So you can see all the tools that are loaded here. And these are going to give me a starting point that I can use to start modeling from. Now this file contains you know, most of the primitives that I'll use if I start modeling anything with the ZModeler brush. So we have cubes, we have uh, cylinders, we have spheres. Uh, we have two cylinders that have different kind of uh, structures, internal structures. So this one has no internal cap structures, and then this one has an internal cap structure. And then we also have a little capsule here as well. So I'm going to start off with this uh, cylinder here that has this little cap. And I'm just going to start manipulating this. So I'm going to turn off my floor here, and I'm going to come up here, and I'm just going to hold control, and this is going to be my masking pen. And basically with the shape, what I want to do is I want to take this cylinder and I'm going to start deforming it and this is going to be that little pod shape or the outer walls for the building I'm going to create here and I'm doing this because it's basically the easiest way um, for me to create this kind of shape so I'm masking and then I can hold control and drag and this is going to extrude that out and you can see I'm now starting to modify the simpler cylinder shape and it's going to give me a new shape so you can see in just a few things like that I now have both of these on this here and then now I can extend this out a little bit more and I can come through and actually modify this a little bit as well to make it a little bit longer maybe I want to make it a little bit taller and I can just play with this design and so this was all starting from that initial sphere I didn't extrude with control and dragging using the gizmo 3d here and then after that was created I can now manipulate the shape and the one thing nice about starting this way is that I have no cuts across my topology here. So if I come and manipulate this, I'm changing the shape, but I'm not going to distort any of that geometry. So all that geometry is still staying clean throughout that entire process. And now after I have my shape here, my initial kind of start for this building here, and what I'm kind of making or designing here is I want to make a little pod. And the pod itself is going to be like a simple living space. So we'll have a bathroom. It's probably going to have a toilet and a sink, and then I'll have a bed. And that's pretty much it. You have a place to put a TV, but it's basically like a just you want to go to sleep and you need to go to the restrooms, and that's it. That's all you're getting in this little living space. And so it would be something that would be very particularly extremely cheap um, to manufacture. And then if they're all kind of modular, you could stack them on top of each other, kind of like a container house, so to say. And when I'm doing this as well, um, I have no <laughs> architectural uh, background or experience whatsoever. So this is just me creating just to create. And so there is no, I, I can tell you about game design and uh, game characters and making character models for games. But as for architecture, I'm just going on the seat of my pants here. So I apologize if any of you out there are architectural you know, gurus. And so I may do tons of things wrong, but you're just gonna have to bear with me because that's what we're doing. All right, so now I have my initial shape and I'm gonna clone this off because basically I wanna make a little compartment for the bathroom and I want that to be kind of sealed. And so at this stage, I wanna make a duplicate of this tool. So I'm gonna go to the subtool menu over here and change how I'm mounting these subtools I wanna see at the same time. So I'm just gonna set this to eight and I'm just gonna create a duplicate version of it. So now I have two of these and these are resting in the same space and they're basically the same mesh. And this allows me to come back and change you know, part of the mesh here if I want it uh, to get back to where I started with, and then I have another one I can modify, and then if everything goes crazy or anything, I can always go back to my initial one. So it's a little kind of thing that I'll, you'll see me do a lot. If you watch any of my streams, I duplicate a lot just so I can go back and forth between those uh, assets. So with the duplicated one here, what I wanna do is I wanna start manipulating with the Zmodeler brush. So I'm gonna go to the brush palette over here, and then I'm gonna scum down at the bottom here and select the Zmodeler brush. The hotkey for this as well is B on your keyboard to open up the brush palette. Then you can isolate by the letter Z. And then if you press M, that's gonna give you the Z modeler brush. 
Now the Z-Miler brush itself is a context sensitive brush. So that means if you hover over a poly, an edge, or a point, you're gonna be able to perform different actions. And by default on this, if you hover over an edge, you're gonna be able to add an edge loop really quickly to your model. And then if you hover over a poly and click and drag, you're gonna be able to pull that surface. And this is kind of gonna give you an extrude, but it's gonna be a smart extrude. So if I start dragging this out and then I come up to another poly and drag this out, you're gonna see it's gonna snap to that. So it's a smart extrude process and it's called QMesh here inside of ZBrush. Now there is a normal extrude too, and you can access these different context uh, processes you can apply to each of these surfaces by hitting spacebar as you hover over one of these. And in here, you'll get a list of actions based on where you clicked. So if I click on the polygon, a polygon on my model, I'm gonna get the polygon action menu. And in here you can see I have a whole wide range of ones that I can select. And then down here, we got a bunch of targets. And then down here, we have some other options and modifiers that go with the targets as well. So there's a whole set of tools in here. And I'm gonna go through some of these as I continue modeling this, and we'll talk a little bit more about what they do. And if I hover over an edge and press space bar, you can see I'm gonna get the edge ones. And then if I hover over a point, I'm gonna get the point ones. So you have all sorts of things you can set with that brush. Now with these brushes too, the defaults for this brush, if you just launch ZBrush, is gonna have insert edge loop, Q mesh and poly, and then move point. And those are gonna be your three default ones. Now you can also set up custom brushes. Um, so if you have any kind of settings that you like more than others, you can store these out as different Z modeler brushes and save them. And then you'll be able to use hotkeys to select that brush and those defaults will be the ones that are selected. So if you wanted say, not Q mesh, but instead you wanted to do say a delete, you could set your polygon action to delete. And so now anywhere you click on a poly with this brush, it's gonna delete that surface. And so you can definitely tailor your, your Z modeler brushes to your liking and have multiple of them inside a ZBrush and then you can quickly hotkey to them and they'll give you different uh, actions to that. So let's see here, I'm gonna try to hit questions as I do this too. Thank you, Kill the Gamers, for the uh, <laughs> keyboard uh, layout stuff there. Um, you can definitely use reference images. So we're asking about reference images to check proportions. The one that's you know fairly easy, you don't have to load anything in, is if you come up to the top here, there's a see-through slider. And if I click and drag this, it's gonna allow me to see through ZBrush, and it's gonna show me what's on my desktop. Now, one thing's nice about this is you can just put that image behind ZBrush. So if I say come over here, and gets my, my little building here, and then I go back to ZBrush and do see-through, and you can see I can now see through to that image. And one thing nice about this is if I come over here and hover across any of the UI in ZBrush, it's gonna go back to being fully opaque, but if I come back to the canvas, then it's gonna go see-through. So this process here, allow, you don't have to do anything else. You just come up here and set see-through, and now you can see the reference behind your model, and so as you rotate around and navigate, you can see I'm still in the canvas here, and you can see I can see that image, but then if I come up here to do any actions, it's gonna go back to being opaque, and it just switches like this really nice. And then you can change the amount in which ZBrush will see through by using this slider here. And then there is also a macro over here that has a toggle see-through, so you can hotkey this, and this will go through and set a value and toggle this automatically. So if I click this, it's gonna turn see-through on and off, and you can see up at the top there that slider's going to 75 and then to zero. And you can edit that text file to set the specific see-through amount that you want as well. So that's definitely one handy thing, especially for referencing to kind of get proportions and things set up. Other ways you can do referencing, uh, you can use Spotlight and you can bring images that way. You could also append a just a plain object. So if I come over here, you can see there's just a bunch of primitives and one's a plain 3D object. So I could append that and then take the texture and apply it to that surface and then that would live in my subtool palette over here. So quite a few ways to do it, but easiest one definitely if you can just put an image behind ZBrush is use that see-through. And that's the one I've been using recently uh, or appending a plane. So another question we have one about UE5. So yeah, I'm, I'm excited about that because definitely if I can model something and I'll have to do low res uh, topology, any map baking, anything, just send the million poly ZBrush model, all means. I'm, I'm, um, that sounds excellent. <laughs> so we got another question, is the way to make edge collapse work on polygroup? Is the collapse complete edge loops, but it totally ignores the polygroup? So fortunately, no, that's just how it's uh, working currently inside, this, uh, inside ZBrush at the moment. 
Uh, to select multiple edges, there's really only, you can do edge loop is one way you can kind of do edges. So if you hover over an edge, uh, if there is a target down here, it's called edge loop, you can definitely do that. So polygroup has poly loop. Um, slide has edge loop and edge loop complete. So depending on, you know, there's no way to really select inside of ZBrush. So what you're using is you're driving an edge action and then you're changing the target. And if the target has the ability to use edge loop complete or any of those, then it will process across multiple edge loops. But there's no way uh, to select edges inside of ZBrush. Now, if you're in say poly group mode or over a poly, you can tag polygons. And so you can do this by holding down alt and clicking. And this will give you a temporary poly group that's gonna be applied on the surface of your mesh there. And then if you do an action, so if I come over and do Q mesh and I have it set to single poly, this is going to process that Q mesh action on the poly I click. And then it's gonna look at any areas that have that white poly group and it's gonna process the action there as well. So if I come over here and Q mesh this poly, you'll see it's also going to process those other polygons that are set with that white poly group. And then if I have those white poly groups don't exist and I just Q mesh this poly, you're gonna see I'm only gonna affect that one. So you can also, with the polygons, you can tag multiple and get those processes to work like that. Uh, another question asking is a way to toggle vertex points. So currently uh, what you get is what you kind of see inside of ZBrush. Uh, if you have dynamic subdivision on and your model is you know very kind of um, really low, you will be able to kind of see these kind of pips for those vertices points, but you're only gonna see those pips if the geometry is offset quite a bit from the dynamic subdivision. Um, so if your dynamic is shrinking your model, you're gonna see the points from where those vertices are in its true geometry, and you're gonna get little lines that are going to the dynamic version. Um, but that's the only way you can really point out points. Uh, there's another thing down here in display properties that's kind of uh, interesting that may kind of help. So there's a polygon draw size, and if you turn this down, you'll see it's gonna start splitting all the polygons. So the, the points are all still there, but it's just changing how those polygons are gonna be rendered. And so this will kind of give you a effect where you can kind of see where all those polygons are spaced out. Now this is just a rendering uh, process here. So it's not distorting your model in any way, shape or form, but you could also use this and kind of get that kind of vertex type look. But for the most part, inside of ZBrush, you're only gonna get that little pip for the vertices if you hover over a point itself, and then the edges are going to uh, be visible through that. Uh, another question, is there any way to make distance in ZMod or how I control distance, how much I want? So the only options you have for basically distance, so say if you're using QMesh, uh, down here at the bottom there is a step size and you can select this. And this will allow you to set a value through here and when you click and drag, you're gonna get steps based on that value. So if I set this to like a high value of like one here and do it, you see I'm gonna get that. And then if I have a low value, I'm gonna get this. So that's really the only uh, kind of way you can set a set size for kind of a step or something that with the QMesh. Now the QMesh will also repeat its action. So if I QMesh this to this distance and this is what I want on this side, if I come over here and just click now, don't click and drag, just click, it's gonna repeat that same distance. So this has now repeated that QMesh action on the other side and it's the same distance, that will be the same distance and that will be the same distance. So the QMesh action and some of the other actions inside of ZBrush will remember how far you clicked and dragged and when you apply it again, it will then repeat that process. So you can definitely use that to your advantage too when you're coming through and modeling, you'll see all these are gonna be the same distance off that surface. So there's no like real distance for anything else inside the model. It's going to be just a, the process for generating any shapes or forms usually click and drags. And so there's no uh, values or anything that are gonna display when you're performing that process. Um, one question here, is it possible to create a V shape? Um, not quite sure what you're looking for in terms of V shape. If you mean like the letter V or like a triangle, um, you can definitely just weld points together and get a triangle shape. And then if you just want the V shape itself, there is a plugin up here that's called Text 3D and Vector Shapes. And you can import in SVG files or text. And so you can make a V that way. Um, and then you can, once that's inside of ZBrush, both of these options will kind of give you a low res uh, version of it. You can then modify that shape with the Z model brush. All right. 
<clears throat> Thank you for the uh, the comments on the comment on the Proco model. I finished the other uh, streams, so I did four streams with Proco, and Proco is a online uh, YouTube channel that has a ton of great artistic and uh, artist tutorials and videos and a bunch of learning material. So if you guys are looking for anything else to kind of watch during these times, um, definitely hop over to uh, Proco's YouTube site and check those out. Uh, Raspberry is asking, can you show me how to use the transpose tool? So there's a lot with the transpose tool. Uh, what are you kind of looking to do with it? Um, and then Mary's asking, is there a hotkey to remove the polygroup that is selected by the alt key? So if you alt click, it's gonna apply the polygroup. If you alt click again, it will remove it, but it's gonna give it a new polygroup color. So unfortunately there's no way to unalt after you've alted it other than giving it a new polygroup or control Z to go back where you were, or you can clear all your polygroups by hitting control W and this will do a group mask, clear mask. And so if you have no masking, you'll give one solid polygroup to everything else. So yes, uh, so we got another one with edges and surface and that's where we're going next. So let's say I have this and what I wanna do now is I wanna punch out this middle area here. So I'm just gonna go back and to punch this out, I'm gonna hover over this poly and I'm gonna go spacebar, enter the polygon action menu. In here, I wanna select the target of polygroup island. And so what Polygroup Island is going to do, it's gonna look at the polygroup I'm clicking, and then it's only going to process the island. So you can see this polygroup here and this polygroup here are the same. However, when I do the Q mesh action, it's only gonna do the island where that polygroup is, and you see it didn't affect the other side. So I just changed the target for the Q mesh brush, so now I can use this and click and drag and pull it inward, and this will now pop a hole all through that surface there. And this should not be causing any craziness here. What's going on here? Got some craziness. What'd we do here? What'd we do? What'd I break? And then with this, oh, I see what I did. Oh, I see what I did. Symmetry, symmetry. Make sure that symmetry is off. Getting crazy with this. All right, symmetry. No symmetry. There we go. Huh, still got a little artifact. I don't know what's going on there. We're gonna, we're gonna keep going here. Keep going. Um, if you have anything like that happening with this object, I know that it's pretty much uh, kind of symmetrical. So I can put local symmetry on, and it's gonna just look at the bounding box. And then I can apply mirror and welds to this. And this will allow me to uh, kind of mirror all the way through. But I need to delete that hidden point first. And so now I can fix any kind of uh, geometry uh, kind of anomalies that would have like that. So it basically took the top and flipped it and made it to the bottom and that removed any of those kind of errors there. Uh, while you're doing the process here with the Z Modeler Brush 2, you can also uh, use creasing. And so if I come over here and uncrease this entire mesh, and then if I activate dynamic subdivision, you're gonna see this is the result I'm gonna get here. So it's smoothing everything. And if I turn my polyframes, you'll see these are shown the points where the true geometry is based in relation to the uh, dynamic. So you can see the offset here. So that's what these yellow points are with the lines. That's the true mesh. And then I have a dynamic on here. I'm previewing it as a subdivided version. So this is why you can kind of see the points in this mode when you have dynamic turned on or off. Now, if you're using dynamic and you want some harsh edges, I could go through and I could start adding insert loops to those edges to kind of get this edge bumping. And the more edges you add to an area, so if I come over here and change this to insert single edge loop, you'll see I'll be able to add an edge loop here. And then if I activate that dynamic again, you're gonna see that edge is holding a little bit better. And if I come over here and act it over here, you can see now I'm getting this, right? So you can always go in and add edges, but this is gonna take a lot of time. You have to do it on every single edge. And then let's say you decide, hey, I didn't really want that edge to be harsh. And if I wanted to go back to that smooth form, I'd have to go back to the model and hold alt and click to remove those edges and remove them back out. And then now turn dynamic and you're seeing I'm gonna get back to the where I had it. So instead of doing all that, you can use creasing. And what creasing is going to do, it's gonna apply that kind of process to your model. So it's gonna look at an edge. I can establish a crease on that edge and it, ZBrush is gonna to try to hold that edge and then smooth everything else in between. Now, luckily there is a bunch of automated processes you can do with creasing. And so one of these is by crease tolerance. So if I come over here and click crease, 
is gonna look at the mesh, it's gonna find anything that's falling in that 45 degree tolerance, and then it's gonna apply a crease to that area. So if I click crease here, you're gonna see I now have this little double line effect that's going along all those edges that fell within this tolerance. And now if I activate dynamic subdivision, it's now gonna smooth my shape out, but I'm still gonna have those harsh edges. So you'll see a lot of the stuff I'm gonna do here is gonna be using this creasing process where it's gonna give me these kind of edges on the sides here, and then it's gonna smooth out any of those other areas in between. So just by activating dynamic, I can see this and see what my model's gonna look like when it's all nice and high poly. So that is using that process there. Now we have one question looking, uh, talking about adding an insert edge loop in between an area of an edge. And so as I'm looking at this shape here, uh, this is really still too thick. I don't want this as thick, I want it to be thinner. So I could come through and I could do this process where I could do a polygroup, give this whole inner area a different polygroup, then I can Q-mesh that polygroup island again. And as I'm performing this Q-mesh, if I hold down shift, this is gonna allow me to perform a move of that area there. And this would allow me to tailor that shape, so I can make this, those walls thinner on my model there. But instead of doing that, I could also just add a edge loop in between these two edges. And to do that, if I hover over this edge here, I can go back and hit spacebar, go to the edge action menu, in here I can select insert, and then there is a target of multiple edge loops and single edge loops. Now if I use single edge loops, you see it's gonna go through and allow me to add an edge loop, but I'm gonna have to eyeball that middle section there. It's not gonna snap to say the middle of those two points. So what I want is I wanna change my insert target to multiple edge loops. Now if I select multiple edge loops and I have the modifier of interactive resolution turned on, when I click, this is gonna add an edge loop. And the first thing it's going to do, it's going to add an edge loop directly in the center. And then after it's directly in the center, if I drag left or right, it's going to add more edge loops. So if I click, that edge loop right now is directly in the center of that surface. And then if I drag up or down, I'd be able to add more edge loops to that area. So sometimes you may wanna add a bunch of different edge loops to a mesh, and sometimes you only wanna add one, but you want it directly in the middle. So changing your target to that multiple edge loop option and then clicking and dragging will allow you to do that. So if I want to add an edge loop directly in the middle of these, just click and drag once and just make sure you don't scroll because scroll is going to give you tons of edge loops. But if you just click and then scroll, it's only going to show you one and that's going to be directly in the center. So that right there is directly in the center of this edge and that edge through that model there. And I can repeat this up top if I want. And now I have those edge loops in the middle of all those surfaces. So some, let's see what I got for questions here. So Raspberry is asking if I want to draw an additional object from an existing object in a straight line. Um, not quite, like, I don't know, so like say if I want to draw an object apart from here and I want to draw a part from here, this may answer your question. Uh, so I'm gonna add another edge loop. So I'm gonna come through here and I'm just gonna add a single edge loop and I'm just gonna put it right here and put it right here. Now I'm gonna do it a little bit off center so this one's higher than this one. And the Z Modeler brush has an option when using Q-Mesh and if you start dragging it out, it's gonna try to perform a weld to the surface in another area. So if I come over here and Q-Mesh a single poly, and this may answer your question with drawing a part from one line to the other. You can see as I drag out, after I hit a certain point, it's gonna see if that edge is gonna hit anything, and then it's now going to you know, go across. So you can see this one's straight because these two lined up, but then I had this one a little offset, so now this is now giving me this little angle. But that's kind of a weld process that you can do with the Z-Modeler brush, and it involves the Q-Mesh action. And so by default, it's going to look for the surface that's kind of across from it, and then it'll snap to it. And this snapping is gonna weld and fuse, so you're not gonna have any internal uh, cavities in there but that's one way you can kind of use that to kind of draw a line across. Um, if that's what you're kind of looking for. Uh, you can definitely do that. But just want to make sure, if you want to be perfectly straight, just make sure you have enough topology that's you know, straight through there and it'll bridge that gap. If you don't want to you know, have it connect, you can also use Q-Mesh and drag. And as you're applying this, if you hold down Control, this will break that poly off. So you can see now I have it as a floating piece of polygon. And then I come in and Q-Mesh off of that and that will now give me 
a new shape from that initial one that is now kind of drawn out in a straight line. And then this is a separate piece of topology, so I can click and drag with Q mesh and hold down Shift, and I can tailor the size of that, maybe tailor that in, and I can repeat it on the other side. So you can kind of do stuff like that too. And this will just allow you to kind of, you know, keep building in this kind of format as well, where you just keep extruding, breaking parts off, and then adding volume to them, and then keep modeling uh, with the C-Mellow brush. So I'll do a lot of that too, especially when creating uh, different shapes. So Maxillens is asking, can do you, like, can you use this to replace some other applications, you know, poly modeling? So it all depends on what you're kind of used to is the main thing there. Um, I, since we have released, uh, since it's been released, it's been in ZBrush for a little while now, I primarily do a lot of my poly modeling inside of ZBrush, like pretty much 99% of it. Um, and most of it's because there's some things in here that I really like. One is that Q mesh action with the snapping. Um, it's very handy to make, you know, quick shapes. Um, so if I want to come in and say, do something like this, I can come through and add this. It'll snap to it. Uh, it's really kind of free flowing. And then when I'm using it, I don't have to worry about importing or exporting from other applications. I can build what I want here. Um, I can then divide it up. I can see it as a high res. I can see it as a low res. Um, I can duplicate it around. So yeah, it's it's replaced a lot of um, my usage uh, in other applications. I was primarily a 3D Studio Max user um, is what my other kind of package of usage was uh, before ZBrush. And then for any of the game stuff, that's usually what it ended up being. So I never used Maya or um, Blender, but definitely uh, 3D Studio Max. My haircut makes me look faster. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the so another question do loops only go in straight lines so loops are going to go based on the topology so a an edge loop is a loop that will go around and it's going to be a consistent loop all the way through um, I'm trying to think if I have an example here that I can show this here let's see we can go on a tangent you guys may not have much of this building <laughs> built today but you're going to get a lot of questions answered <laughs> So I'm gonna come over here, I'm gonna grab this, and we're gonna do a, where are we at? Initialize Q cube. I'll do a four by four by four. All right, so let's say I have this object, and on one side here, so this is another thing you can use a collapse functionality, and this will allow you to collapse edges. So I can come through and collapse these. Now, this is an example of kind of an edge loop, okay? So if I have the Z-Mala brush and I wanna add an edge loop, if I come here and try to add this, it's going to look at the edges and look at their kind of direction they're flowing in, right? So it's gonna look at these two and then also look at these. And if I add this edge loop here, I'm gonna get a vertical only line. And so it's not gonna take this and go around this corner here because this is not forming a loop. However, this corner is now forming a loop. So you can see as I come through here, it's kind of giving this pathway. There's none of these angles like this. Like it's not a T road, basically. Like if you come to like a crossroads on a road, it's more of like a turn. And so if I add an edge loop in here, you'll see it's gonna affect that whole area. So it's gonna go up and around that surface versus this where it's only gonna go straight. So if you have you know, any kind of geometry that's flowing like this, you're gonna be able to come in and add those edge loops and it's just gonna follow that topology. So this will make it not straight, but if you have your topology set up like this and you try to edge edge loop, that's where you're gonna get just basically a straight line through there. Um, we got one question about softening the bevels. So if I come back here, we're talking about that dynamic subdivision using creasing. So let's go with this and we're gonna turn dynamic on. And you can see this is what I'm getting, it's kind of harsh. So you can soften the bevel and you can do it with this uh, smooth subdivision slider right here. And so if I start, uh, actually no, this crease level slider right here. So right now this is maxed out at 15, so you're not gonna get any smoothness on any of your creased edges. But if you start lowering this down, this slider and this slider are gonna play together. And so what it's doing is it's going to only crease up to a smooth subdivision level of two, and then it's gonna apply smoothing on top of that. So this will allow you to control how smooth those edges are. So now you can see I have it a little bit beveled. And if I come through here and decrease this down to one and then choose this smooth setter up, now it's a little bit softer. And then if you see, if I go down, I'm gonna get harsher. 
So this is gonna be based upon these two sliders here. And basically what it's telling ZBrush is, hey, hold the creasing until this subdivision level. And then after that, just smooth away like normal. So you can control how harsh those angles are gonna be using this slider here. So that's, if I have creasing level set to zero and smooth subdivision set to three, you can see that it's going to smooth at every single subdivision. If I come and set this at one, it's going to not smooth the first subdivision level, and then it's gonna go through and start smoothing after subdivision level one. So you can kind of use that slider there to tailor that out too. And then in addition to that, you can always come through and modify your edges and add beveling to them. Um, so let's say I come through here and I come across this insert edge loop. In here, there's a uh, bevel option and you can have edge loop complete on this. And you have some modifiers down here that will allow you to add single rows, linear rows, and uh, different sharpness values. And so if I come through and click and drag on my model there, let me turn up my polyframes here. Let's adjust my crease level back. And if I click and drag here, you can see it's gonna bevel that edge loop. And so see as it's beveling out, you can also do that. This fortunately is going to modify your topology though. So if you just want it in that preview fashion, uh, this is definitely going to modify it. So adding any of those bevels there is gonna change the topology. So you can see as I'm doing that, I'm adding bevels along that entire edge loop and see that's what I'm getting on my model there. And then I can clear my creasing and then crease again by 45. And then if I activate dynamic there and come in and maybe hit these with their own crease. So the edge action of crease as well will allow you to control edges creasing individually. So you don't have to use the sliders over here. You can do it manually if you want. And then come through and just add creasing to those different areas there. And then with dynamic turned on, see now I'm gonna get that. So that's one way you can go through and bevel uh, some geometry too. There's also a hidden feature in the crease menu as well. So if I come through and say, do a polygroups group by normals. So this is gonna give me a polygroup based on a uh, base width angle as well. So just like we're doing with the creasing, now I have a different polygroup in all those areas. And if I come back up to the crease slider here, there's a bevel width slider. And what this will allow you to do, it's going to add bevel geometry in between different polygroups. And polygroups inside of ZBrush are just basically, think of them as like selection, selection sets in other applications. So it's applying a color to a polygon in your model. And then this allows you to quickly select or hide different parts. And so if you click on a point in one of those areas, it's gonna allow you to isolate those things. So it's kind of like a selection set in other applications. And with this, if I come to the bevel slider here and I hold down the control key and then click and drag, this is now gonna form a bevel between all those polygroups. So you can see now it's gone through and every area where that polygroup had a breakup, where it was two different polygroups, it is now applied a bevel in that surface there. So you can also use that little trick there to quickly come through and apply beveling to your models. Now that bevel width slider works the best if you have surfaces that are uh, convex and not concave. So if you have uh, topology that's like this and that bevel applies, if these are your two polygroups and they're downward, if you do it this way, it's gonna work, right? If you do it this way, these things are now gonna go inside each other. Now you can clean that up if you run it through the um, deformers and use the remesh by Boolean, that would definitely come through and you know fix that back up for you. But just remember that that crease option there by holding control and using that bevel with slider is gonna work best in this kind of fashion where it's going in a convex surface rather than a concave surface. So just a little thing there as well. Uh, so question about the multiple duplicates of a tool. So basically to do any of that, all you need to do is, this can be done with the Gizmo 3D or the transpose line, and you just need to hold down the control key and then click and drag any of the move options. And if you do that, you'll then get a duplicate of that area. And this will look at the masked parts of your model too. So you can say you can do extrudes with the gizmo or transpose line. And then after you've offset it, if you release control and drag, this is gonna allow you to create duplicates of that too. So you can see now I've just taken that and now I've offset those and I can just continue offsetting as needed. So that one question there we had about how to use uh, multiple multiple uh, duplicate process with the transpose tools. Let's see what else I got here. So Lucky's asking, is it possible with ZModeler to make a tube out of a poly loop? Like if you wanted the one edge of that tube to be a tubular shape. So, so you guys are definitely uh, 
I, I, I enjoy answering the questions is the problem here. So let's come through here and I'm just gonna do a polygroup on this just to give it a different polygroup color there. And then I'm going to QMesh and do uh, polygroup island. Just gonna let me do that. And I'm just gonna drag this out and then I'm gonna hold down control key to break it off, okay? So we're talking about tubes, right? So if I have this shape here, I can now give it thickness. So there we have a thickness shape like that. And then now with this shape, so this is basically a tube, but it's a four-sided tube. And there's a lot of things inside of ZBrush just modeling wise, you can think of it in these kind of principles and practices. Like if you have a cube and you disable all these edge creases I've had, it's gonna give you a tube. So I've just pulled this face off and now I'm gonna come over here and I just want to select that part quick and I'm just gonna do an uncrease all on that. So the uncreasing button over here is gonna work on visibility. So it's now removed the creasing from that tube area. And now if I activate dynamic subdivision, you see it's going to keep the creasing on everything else. But now what it's done is with this creasing removed, I now have that tube shape. So this is handy too, especially if you're doing you know, low polygon modeling and anything. Basically, if you just have it as a four-sided, if you apply subdivision surfaces to that, dynamic subdivisions, uh, any sort of processes like that, it's gonna shrink it to a tube. And so you can use that to your advantage. And so you're just pulling off a cube, which is fairly easy to do. Um, you don't have to worry about anything crazy. And then after it's pulled off, just give it a little, give it thickness and then um, take all that creasing off and now you have a tube shape. Uh, so we have one question from Saeed. Is there a way to export out post files from ZBrush to Maximaya? If you use Transpose Master, which is in the area up here in Z plugin, you can definitely T-pose your mesh and this will give you a file. And you can take that file and export that out as an OBJ. As long as you don't change the, um, the vertex order, you'll be able to bring that back in and then you can update your entire mesh with it. So yes, there's definitely a way you can do that. Uh, there is no way, the question is a way to get rid of the custom pop-up menu. There is not. That's you guys. There's no way to get rid of that currently. So Mary's asking, when I create subdivision level after using ZModeler, and I cannot use ZModeler again because I must delete the higher. Uh, this is correct. So this is why the dynamic subdivision option over here is going to be your friend when using the ZModeler brush, because this is going to allow you to preview your mesh in that subdivision form. So if it's on over here, it's giving you a preview of what the mesh would look like with low res geometry. Now you could get back your uh, subdivisions if you applied this, you can always reconstruct. However, you're gonna have to delete those hires on it. So the ZModeler brush is only gonna work on meshes that have um, no subdivision levels. And if you need to see what it looks like high res, this dynamic option is gonna be your friend there. All right, I'm, trying, I'm almost at the bottom of these questions here. Uh, Lucky's asking how can, how'd I split it off again? So we'll go back in time here a little bit. So I just uh, made a polygroup on this section here and I'm just using the Q mesh action. And this will work with extrude or Q mesh. So if you hover over that poly, you can see Q mesh is here and we're in the polygon action menu. And then there's also an extrude option here. Now when you do this, if you click and drag on that island there, this is where you're gonna get, this is the normal Q mesh action. However, if you hold shift, this is going to give you a move. So it's going to move that area instead of perform that Q mesh action. And then if you hold down control, it's gonna split it off. So it's using the Q mesh action on any poly that you have. And then when you're doing it, hold down the control key and that will break that Q mesh action. And it's gonna split off that top there. And then now you can come through and Q mesh again without control and that will give that part thickness. So that's how you can break that off. So if you wanted to say, so Lucky's also asking, is there a way to kind of extract it out of it? So let's say I want to add a pipe to this area here. So I can do that insert multi-mesh process again, or insert multiple edge loops. In here, there's an interactive elevation option I can use. And this will allow me to say, like, if I just want this bumped out and kind of look like a tube on the side, I can click and drag on this. And as I do this, it's gonna pull it up and then I can add resolution to that. And that's also gonna kind of give me that effect 
of that kind of piping. So you can definitely do that process too and get that applied to your mesh. That's another way there. Uh, another kind of method you can do as well is if you have a division in polygroups, like I have here and here, if you come up to the stroke menu up here, there is in the curve modifiers or curve function area, there's this frame mesh option. And what frame mesh will allow you to do is allow you to generate a curve around a uh, different selection set. So I could do around border, polygroups, or creased edge. And if I do this, it's gonna give me a curve along the surface. Then I could take, say, a brush that's an IMM curve brush. So if I came over and did like multi-curve, or I think we just have a curve one in here too. Uh, curve tube. I can click on that curve and then that will populate that curve with that cylinder. So that's another way you could add, say, a tube across the surface as well. So using that uh, process of locating a crease or a polygroup division and then adding a curve to that. There's also in the ZMod brush, if you go over the edge option here, there is an add to curve option and you can create curves on that surface as well if you want to do that. But this one only has a target of edge, so you'd have to come through and you know select multiple edges to get that curve. But some things there too. Uh, William's asking, is there a way to center the, your model to the gizmo itself? So no, you can center the gizmo to the model, but you cannot center the model to the gizmo. So Remy's asking, is there a way to modify the shape and direction of the QMesh face after you pull it off with control? So basically these are gonna be your kind of options down here. So for the QMesh action, if I have that selected, these are the only things you're gonna get down there. So you're not gonna have any other stuff that's gonna be able to happen when you're using QMesh and pulling it off from that surface. Now, if you wanna make it larger and smaller afterwards, you can definitely use another action. So if I QMesh this out, hold control and pull it off, I can now come across this surface and do something say like scale, you know, and then I can scale, you know, just that. I can scale, you know, all the geometry islands of that. And that will allow me to do that process. So, but the QMesh action itself, the only option you're gonna get for that are the ones that are down here in the modifiers. And so these are just stepping um, in terms of stuff. And then down here, you just have the modifiers for the attraction, but the actual control pop off. Um, this is it, you're just gonna be able to pull off that surface how it is. But after it's off, you can modify it with anything else. Uh, Saeed's asking about the show ultimate document view and preferences. So this one is just legacy um, is what it is. So if you go to, I don't even know where it is. Uh, it's interface UI. And this is just gonna give you another view of your document. So if I turn this on and then come up here, I have another view of my model up here. This is just legacy stuff that's been in there since the 2.5D days, because basically you could see your model kind of zoomed in or with AA half on one area up here and then see your model not an AA half on the bottom. Um, there's really no other uh, use for it in there. Uh, now that we have some other things like this uh, thumbnail view over here, you can kind of get the same effect out of that. And then we also, if you have multiple models in here, you can also use split screen and split screen will show you one mesh on one side and your other meshes on the other side. So it kind of isolates one and shows you everything else, which is really nice for doing anatomy studies and things like that. But the Alt view option in interface UI is, is just legacy. It's just been in there since the 2.5D days. Uh, so frame mesh is, we'll do it based on uh, geometry itself, visibility or polygrouping. So if I just want it coming across this edge, basically what I wanna do is I want to make sure that I have two polygroups only on this model. So I'm gonna come around in the back here and just, I need to add an edge loop in here quick. So I've got that and I've got that. And then if I come through and just hold control and shift to isolate and then control shift to hide, I'm just hiding the kind of areas I don't want. So let me actually give me a polygroup here too. So I can hide that and hide that. And now basically if I want to use that frame option and only get that curve to go in the middle, I just want to make sure my model only has two polygroups. So right now I want to make sure this entire thing has one polygroup. So I have the parts hidden and if I hit control W on my keyboard, it's going to give everything visible a polygroup. And then I can flip my visibility by holding control and shift and dragging off like this, you get a little green box. And this is now going to give me the other parts and then I can hit control W and give that a polygroup. Now, if I bring everything back, you're gonna see my cube now has two polygroups. So it has this and this. 
So now I can go to the at stroke palette again and go to the curve functions frame mesh area. I want to turn off border and I want to turn off creased edges. And I just want to leave on poly groups. And now when I click this frame mesh, you're going to see I'm only going to get a curve between those poly groups. So that's a way you can kind of control how that goes. Now you can also do it by open edge and it'll come through and do that. Um, but if you have the poly group one, you're going to be able to kind of get that edge where you want it. And then after that edge is in there, you can select, you know, a curve brush. And my brush size is probably a little bit too big, you know, too small. And you'll see it adds it right along that curve. And then after you've had this added, uh, what you can also do if you want to split it up from the model. So right now when you added that curve, it's only adding it as an unmasked portion. So if I turn my polyframes there, you can see the curve that I added is unmasked and everything else is masked. So now I can come back up here to my subtool area, go to the split area here. And in here we have a split unmasked points. And this is going to take those two parts and then split the unmasked portion out. So now I have my cube and then I also have my little frame. So one little thing there. And then with this, after you've done with your curves, if you're done with them, um, you can click on the model to clear them, but I usually come up here and just click the delete option and that will remove your curves as well. So hopefully that helps with that. Uh, Mary's asking, unrelated, uh, is there anything she can use to make alphas that's not Photoshop? So what I've been using for any kind of alpha generation recently, especially with vector stuff, is I've been using Infinity Photo. Um, I really like it a lot for the vector aspects. And so you just need to export those out as 16-bit uh, grayscales. And uh, once those are grayscaled, you can then import them into ZBrush and they work nice. So I've been using that. That's my go-to for over Illustrator currently. I use Illustrator from time to time too, but I like Infinity. It's got it's a little bit simplistic, more simplistic. My, my brain can wrap around it. So, uh, Saeed's asking, is the way to see the front and the back of the model is mesh at the same time? No. So you're only gonna get one view of your mesh at a time. Now, if you just want to do like uh, see what it looks like while you're working on the front, you can definitely just place it on the canvas quick and then hit Shift S, and this will snapshot. And so it kind of gives you like a little. 2.5D version of your model. So if you just want to see like, oh, I want to see what the back looked like while I was doing that, you can kind of do that. But there's no way to see um, your model uh, in the same, like two versions of your model at the same time. So the alt view won't do that, and then the uh, split screen won't either. All right, so we're gonna get to this. We're gonna make some windows. We're gonna add some stuff here. All right, so I've got my base shape. Um, I've added this little kind of extra area here, and with this, what I want to do is I'm going to do a, uh, another poly group here and just give this a different color. And I just want to cut this down even more, so I've already punched that middle hole out, but these walls are still a little bit too thick. So I can come through and Q-mesh this out as a poly group island and make sure my symmetry is turned off. And if I do this correctly, I should be able to punch all the way through to the other side here. Let me get in close here. Give that a new poly group. What's that masking on? Come on now, QMesh. QMesh is making me making me lie here. Oh man, we're we're having we're having fun now. <laughs> I had something wrong with this model here. Hold on. Hold on. Wait for it. Let's go back. Let's go back to two to stage one. So what happens when I go on tangents? I lose my train of thought. It also turns out that this room I'm in today may not have air conditioning. It's kind of getting hot. So you're gonna, you might see me like start glistening. All right, so. <laughs> all right, so I'm gonna crease everything here just to kill all my creasing. I'm going to do a brush reset here. So if any time you change the setting in a brush and you may not know what you changed, um, if you go over to the brush palette over here, down at the very bottom, there's a reset all brushes and this will reset everything really quick. And then now I can go back to that Z Molly brush, Q mesh, we'll do poly group island, click and drag, pop that out. I don't know why this one, uh, my creasing failed me on this. So we're gonna do that process again, modify topology, do a quick mirror and weld in Y to fix that area there. 
Then I'm gonna add that kind of edge loop back in. And I want it on both sides this time, so this is something I didn't do earlier. Um, but if I hold down Control and Shift, this is gonna allow me to get the slice curve brush. And when you're doing stuff like this, like let's say I wanna put a window or a door through here, like uh, we just had a question on. If I insert an edge loop here, you'll see that it's not gonna insert on the outside because it's only gonna do the edge loop on the inner. And so if I want this to line up perfectly with that, it's, it's kind of hard to do it this way, right? I, I'm not gonna be able to find exactly where that edge matches up on that inner side. So what you can do instead is you can use the slice curve brush, and this is a control shift brush. So if you hold down control and shift, this is usually gonna give you the select rectangle brush. But instead of that, I can use slice curve. And what slice curve is going to do, it's going to slice through the entire model based in the screen space. So if I hold down control and shift and click, it's gonna give me this little line. And after I have this line drawn out, I can move this around by holding down spacebar. And then if I line this up and release, this is now going to slice through the model at that location. And this is always gonna do it in camera space, so whatever, however you have your model positioned, when you perform that slice, it's gonna slice through. And so as you can see, now it's sliced around the edge, and it's also sliced on the middle area there. So this is handy, especially if you're doing like rings or things like this, where you want that slice to be consistent on that inside and that outside. So then if I wanna come through and say add a window, I can just add a few more slices through here like this. And then if I wanna punch this out, get Q mesh, single poly, click and drag, and boom, now I've got a bus, right? There you go. If schools were still in session, kids could be taking it to school. So, there, so there's a, a little thing there with that. So I'll do a slice a lot in terms of that. And there's another slice option other than curve and that's slice rectangle. And this one's really fun uh, to play with uh, just when creating stuff. So if I come to the top here and I drag this out, it's gonna give me this kind of option here and it's gonna slice a rectangle through my model. So you can see it generate a slice there. Now after I have that rectangle generated, I can do Q mesh and then do polygroup uh, island again and drag that out and see now I can start designing stuff like this. And then I come through, see on this side, slice that, pull this out, let's do that polygroup island like that. Or actually we can just come through and tag it. With that alt polygroup and then pull that out. And so you can keep doing things like this to get little different designs using this brush. So that one's a lot fun, a lot of fun to uh, play with. And it's just gonna cut through, so instead of adding the edge loops manually, you're just slicing through it. Now you do have to be a little bit kind of um, careful when you do it, because you can see when I created this slice, it now generated this kind of polygon through here. And we were talking about earlier about how those edge loops flow if you try to cut an edge loop in. Before I had this effect, if I came over here and inserted an edge loop, it would have went straight through the model here. But now since I've added this slice, it's changed my loop flow. So my poly loop flow is different now. So you can see as I add that edge loop, it's now going up and over and down rather than going through. Now you can get around that again by going back to that say slice curve and this is gonna allow you to put that edge loop wherever the heck you want. Um, but definitely uh, gotta be a little cautious too if you wanna keep things with uh, consistent edge looping. But one little thing there as well. So what I did with this is I wanted to add, say, that edge loop in there in the middle to kind of shorten this up. And actually, we're just going to do it like this. So let's go through here. I'm going to polygroup this, polygroup this, and this. Now, if you want to apply a new polygroup to an area while you're doing this process, if you press Alt, it's going to allow you to get a new polygroup coloring to that area. So you can just tap that until you get a color. Sometimes the polygroups are random when they assign. So if it's a little bit difficult for you to see, you can always hit Alt and change that. And then after you have that applied, you can then use those options um, with any of your actions that have that as a target. So I'm just gonna shrink this in a little bit and make it a little bit less thick. And then after I have this, if I go to see through and see my image here, we're gonna, we're gonna use this a lot today, I think. Um, I've got these little lines through here, so I wanna add those. I also have this area here for say the bathroom, where the bathroom is. And then in that area, there's also a hole. So I'm gonna go through and add those shapes there. And then we wanna make uh, some of the furniture kind of in here. It's, it's very simplistic modeling for these things, but it just gives enough kind of silhouette and form um, so that you can actually see you know, something different in the little rooms there. And then I also have this divider that has a little door through there too. So I wanna make that as well. So I'm gonna go back into ZBrush. And with this kind of on the side here, I wanna add a, uh, another tube as you were already talking about. 
uh, just to catch light as well. So I'm gonna render this out, and when I'm rendering this, uh, I'm thinking also as I do this, how I'm gonna break this up. And I wanna break it up into separate parts, and then each of those parts I can apply a different material to, and that will allow me to get kind of different variations or uh, differences in where things connect or meet. So with my outer shell here, I know I'm gonna have this all be kind of one, um, one kind of shape here. So I'm gonna increase and increase that. So this is gonna be one color. And then I kind of want a little beveled edge that we talked about when we're just making that little pipe shape. I want something like that on that inner area. So I just have that little kind of effect in there. So I can make that metal to contrast, say a white outer surface, and then they'll give me a little detail in there. And then I want to add you know, lines through here that would kind of support the top and the bottom of the floor and also give a kind of a area where if you had, say, glass in this building, it would also connect to as well. So something to hold those panels of glass in. So I want to add those two. So I'm going to take this shape here and I'm going to do that Q mesh process again now that I've got this thinner. So I'm going to hover over that edge and do poly group poly loop and just add a, a different colored poly loop edge there. And just keep hitting alt until I get something that I can see a little better and then get one there. If you're doing this too, if you have a material that's kind of dark like this matte cap gray, if you switch to say like a brighter one like skin shade four, you'll be able to see those poly group coloring, the contrast of those a little bit easier. So another little trick there. And then I'm a Q mesh poly group all on this and then you can see I'm getting it on both sides. So if I wanted this to be kind of like a TV or a window, I can definitely get that. And as I'm drawing this out, I'm gonna separate this one again. So I'm gonna hold down uh, that control key and break it off. So now I have that as a separate part. And then I'm gonna go and now I'm gonna split this off. And so what I wanna do is I wanna put that as its own subtool and then I wanna grow it back into the existing surface. So I could add thickness to it like we did with the existing pipe where I'd come through and add thickness and then smooth it. But you can see this is now being detached from my outer edge and I want it to be bordered with it. So a little trick you can do here is after I've broken that out, I can now come down here to the auto groups area in the polygroups. And it's gonna look at geometry islands and it's gonna give me a new polygroup for each geometry island. And since I pulled that one part out, it's now its own island and it's floating in space. So I have my shell and then I have these two pieces that are floating. And you can see each of these has a different polygroup. So now I can hide the outer shell and then I can go back to that subtool palette up here and do a split hidden this time instead of split unmasked points. This will now take those parts and split them off. So now I have two subtools on my model here. I've got, I think I just found out what I am hitting here that's making chaos. My tablet has touch turned on. <laughs> it's not good. That's, that's definitely what's going on here. I keep hitting keys on the side of my tablet over here and they keep doing things I don't want them to do. <laughs> so that would be what is happening. All right, so now I've got these parts split off. So I've got my shell that still looks like this. So it was this one. And then I've got the inner loops I just broke off. Now I want these to go into the walls themselves and not float into the room. So I'm gonna flip the polygons on this. So I'm gonna, right now the front faces are going inward and I wanna flip the entire topology so the front faces are going backwards. So if I come down here to the display properties down here, there is a flip. And so now flip those. So I just took all the faces on that subtool and flipped it outward. Now after this is flipped, I can now come in here and do a Q mesh all polygons. And as I draw this out, this is now going to kind of flip that effect. So now I have those points, but instead of shrinking it, I grew it out. So I took the faces, pulled them off, flipped them, and now extruded them back out. And now if I get out of solo here, you're gonna see now I'm gonna have them connecting into that surface. Now I can also come through and now Q mesh these, or actually I'm gonna extrude these here. So I'm gonna come across this and press spacebar. Instead of Q mesh, I'm gonna use extrude, click and drag and hold, oh, do all polygons, click and drag and just extrude those inwards. This is gonna give me a little bit, kind of a smaller area there. And then if I isolate this again, I come through and add a new poly group to that poly loop on both sides and then extrude all, extrude, poly group all. I can pull that out a little bit more. 
So there's a lot of stuff and a little tailoring you can do with the shapes inside a ZBrush. You're not, there's multiple ways to do things, so don't think that there's always one right way to do stuff. Um, you can definitely go in and modify different ways. Like that way I used extrude and then I extrude it out. And then when I did the extrude the first time, it shrunk it. So instead of doing an inflate or anything like that or a scale, the extrude process with all polygons shrunk that shape in and it got it a little bit smaller. Uh, correspondingly, I can also came through and you know just select the side and pushed it in. I could use the scale. So there's a lot of different uh, ways to get around things. All right, let's see what else we got here. Uh, Lucky's asking, is there a way to do different hard colors on pieces of geometry? So inside of ZBrush, if you have a polygonal surface, say like this part here, the coloring for um, any of the materials is always going to be based off um, basically vertex. So if you apply a material here and here, uh, when they render, you're going to kind of get potentially this bleed effect going on between the two. Now there's a few ways around this. So the one way is model in separate parts. That's always going to give you, you know, a clean kind of process between two different zones. Uh, the other thing you can do is if you have a model and it's specifically just for rendering, if you come up here to the modified topology area, this is high level, high level stuff here. There's an unweld groups border and this will allow you to split the polygroups on your model by its border and it's basically going to just break them off. So all the polygroups are now going to be separate across all your borders. Now this is going to make your model not watertight. However, now you can select each of those individual groups and apply a different polygroup to it. And at render time, since those edges are no longer welded, you're not going to get that bleed effect that's going to go across. Um, there's also a render setting in here. Let's see if I can find it here. That is a material setting. I can't remember exactly where it's at. Uh, Paul, who also does a lot of streaming, he, he knows exactly where these things are for this, but I may not find it. Oh, here it is. So render, render properties, material blend radius. This will also allow you to kind of get a blend between two materials and you can change the slider and this will sometimes help in getting that kind of cross bleed between different materials. If you do color, it's just going to be all based on vertex, but if you're doing it by material and polygrouping, if you use, say, mess with this materials blend radius slider here or go to modify topology and do this unweld groups border when you do your rendering and then I'll separate those areas. So that may help you there, Lucky. Uh, Mary's got another question. She's asking if there's a way to make a polygroup while dragging an alpha onto the surface of the model. So currently there is not. Um, if you model, if you just drag an alpha on the surface of the model, it's just distorting the vertices. So it doesn't really know where that kind of area ends to assign a different polygroup to it. If you know your surface um, between the two, there are some little tricks you could potentially do. So there's one that will allow you to do kind of a uh, morph difference effect. Um, you could also potentially uh, do it by color. So if you drag out that alpha and have it as a different color, you can then go to the uh, polygroups from polypaint and that will look at those differences. So if you think of your alpha, if you have no painting on your model and you wanna just kind of find out, uh, when I dragged this out, it gave me a, um, a distortion because I was dragging it with an alpha. So I got an effect and I just wanna see the difference between the two. You can try, uh, when you drag that alpha out, set it to like a white color, like fill your model to entire black, set the alpha to white. When you draw that out on your surface, that part that you're now distorting should come out as a white color as you drag it out. And then you can try to use this uh, polygroups from polypaint and I'll look at the difference between those and it may be able to give you enough of the uh, polygrouping from those variations where you'll actually end up with the drag that you just dragged out as its own polygroup. So you can try that um, and see if that works. But there's no way to do it by default. Um, you could also duplicate your subtool and then um, if you have two of them sit in the same space and then you deform one versus the other, you'd be able to see the difference in the offset between those two. Uh, it wouldn't give you a polygroup, but you could have the meshes kind of intersecting each other and have those two things separate so you can clearly see what was sculptural and what was not. Uh, Saeed's asking is a way to make a pivot point from the ray mesh on the face or line of the model. So the best thing you're gonna do with that is use the transpose line um, and the sliders. There's no way to really have it set off a point. Um, 
if I finish this building here, <laughs> we'll get into a ray mesh. I've got, I've got a little less than an hour now, so I need to start. I need to start modeling some stuff here. And I've I've lost my initial shape here, so we've got we've got some fun stuff coming. Here, let's see if I can get my undo history back on this. So another reason for duplicating, if you ever duplicate something, um, you can always go back in time on it too, which is friendly to do. So I duplicated it, and I have my part that I modified, and then. So that was on the wrong subtool uh, when I was modifying this one. So I wanted to get back to that. So I just was able to duplicate it and then go back to the one and go back in time. And then now I got to my shape that I wanted here because this is, I wanted this part. And so now I have my edge and I've got this inner part and then I've got my little border. For my inner part here, I'm now going to distort this because I want to start creating that inner space for where that bathroom's going to live. So I'm just taking this and this is all this is here and I'm just using the Gizmo 3D. I want to make sure it's centered, so I'm gonna click this little button here, this little home button, and then I can pull this in and kind of see where it's at in the surface there. Now it's okay if it's penetrating some right now because I can come through and tailor this a little bit more, but basically I just want to kind of get it inwards to it. And then now with this, if I go back to my see-through drawing there, you can see it takes up about a third, right? So it's about a third, maybe, maybe a sixth, eh, somewhere between a third and a fourth of the space there. So I want to add that in. So to do this, I want to cut through my inner part here. So I have one part that's kind of that bathroom area and then the other part that's open. So I'm going to use that slice curve option again and I come through and just slice this out really quick. So just coming through and slicing. And then I can hide this. And now it's going to give me that hole. Now with this uh, kind of shape here, um, there's two things I kind of want to do. So I want to first make the shape so it's solid. And then I'm going to come through and remove this part of the shape and then extrude this inward to give me that wall interior. So I've just added the slice so I have a nice row of topology through there. And now I can come through and I can use, I could hide it and I could close holes or manually bridge. Um, or I could try to use the Q mesh action with a single poly and I can click and drag and just remove these surfaces out of there. And as long as my topology on front and back are lined up, I'll be able to remove that part out. And now if I wanted a kind of alcove over here, that's kind of a happy accident that I could go with. <laughs> I've modeled this wonderful modeled empty triangle has been, uh, <laughs> it took me an hour to model the empty triangle. <laughs> the empty rectangle, one hour. That's gotta be a new record. All right, so I've got the, uh, that side there and the other side. So now I've got that. Now I want to hide this part. So I'm going to hold Control and Shift and get that select rectangle brush. Hide that, then remove this. So geometry, modify topology, delete hidden. Then now I have this little kind of area carved out. And what I want to do is I want to remove some more geometry from this. So I'm going to make sure I have that select rectangle brush selected. I'm going to hold down Control and Shift and I'm going to drag over this top corner. And when I do this, I'm gonna hold down the Alt key. This is now gonna give this this red box and any kind of points that are inside this red box are gonna vanish. And it's gonna take any of the connected edges and polys with it. So if I do this and now click, you'll see it's gonna look like everything vanished. But if I rotate, you can see I'm still left with this wall. So this is what I want. I just want this part through my mesh here. I can now come over here to, and delete hidden again. And now I can extrude this. And so I'm gonna do that same process where I'm going to flip it. So I get the inner cavity there. So there's my inner shape. Do Q mesh, all polygons, click and drag, add that like so. Now I've added thickness to that area there. Turn off my polyframes and get back out of my mesh there. You can see now I have that kind of alcove being generated there. So I've got that little bathroom area starting to come into focus. I can adjust this kind of top part because it's a little bit extruding through the roof here. So I'm just going to activate the gizmo, center on the mesh, and just scale it down slightly. I just want it to go into the model rather than sticking out of it. And I can move this also in a little bit so it's not sticking through the back part of the wall. And I just, I'm embedding this into the geometry surface right now. So this is fine because um, it's, it's just going to be a render here. So I'm not really too concerned about stuff sticking in the surfaces of others. I just want to make sure it's not protruding. So when I render it with a different material, I can't see it. Like I want to make sure it's hidden. So I'm just embedding stuff and other things. So now that I have this shape here, now I need to cut in a door on this side here. I need to add a window over here. And then I want to soften this corner up too. 
So to soften this corner, there's a few processes I could do here. If I come back up to my creasing here and I do an uncrease all, and I'm hitting the tablet buttons again. This is what's happening here. This is why stuff is vanishing. And if I turn on creasing, you see this is what I'm getting with it being harsh creasing. Now, if you do anything like this that has these really harsh corners, you'll see that it got the crease angles for all these, but it didn't hit this one. So if I turn on dynamic subdivision, this one is not creasing, which is why you're getting this little webbing effect. If you don't want this and you want to be extremely harsh, you just cover over that edge, go to the crease area, make sure you just have your target of edge selected, click, and it's going to apply a crease right there. Then I can apply a crease down here. And now when I apply dynamic subdivision, you can see that webbing has gone away. Now, what I want to do is I want to soften this edge. So this edge right through here is a little bit harsh. So if I start removing the creasing on this edge by holding down Alt, you're going to see it's going to start softening this when I have dynamic applied. However, that is way too soft, right? So it's going all the way through, and now I've got this really, really bent surface. I also have some topology that's kind of going into itself right now, so I don't really want that to happen. So what I want to do is I want to add some edge loops this way and this way, so I can then remove the creasing along this edge and get a soft curve based on the selection. Now this is now, since I did this extrude with the Q mesh, this is a nice edge loop through here. So if I start adding edges, it's not gonna really break it. And so to do this edge edging process, I could come over and hover an edge and do insert edge. And this will allow me to insert an edge, Oop. get the right one, single poly loop there. And you see as I do this, it's first by default going to try to match the edge I'm kind of closest to. So if I add an edge over here, you can see it's going to line up there. But as I move over this one, you see how it's curving. And I don't really want this curve to happen. I want it to be straight. I want it to be like straight over here. So as I'm doing this, if you hold down shift, it should be shift. Let's try that again. I lied to you guys. Totally lied. Shift should give me a constant width on this and should allow me to do it. All right, we're going to plan B. All right, so I come over here and select the slice curve again. And then I come across and drag this to those areas. Slice, which is going to give me an edge loop there. Slice, edge loop there. And now I have this still being that nice edge loop. And now I have two edge loops in the vertical. And now if I come through and hover over this edge and go into the crease, Edge loop complete, hold down Alt and click. I'm just going to remove the creasing along that edge. And now if I apply my dynamic subdivision, you can see now I have a nice soft walled edge there. So now I've got that no longer being harsh, and now I have this nice little shape. So I got a solo, and you can see now that room there isn't looking so crazy. It's got a little soft edge in there. So that's more kind of just giving a different light effect as light's hitting it. So it's not giving that harsh angle. Now you have a nice little bleed there. So that's looking a little bit better. For the door itself, this is another easy one. So I'm just going to isolate that. And with the door, basically, I just want to add you know, some supporting edges on the sides. I can do this with the uh, crease option again. Or since I've gone through and actually used the slice brush through here, if I now add an insert edge loop through here, you know it's going to be nice and straight. So I can just add insert edge loop there insert edge loop here, and then add another one right there. And I just want enough, basically, that um, I have the supporting element through here. I want a supporting element all the way around. Because what I'm going to do is I'm going to come in, and I don't want this to be just a straight, straight door. I don't want the door frame to be straight. I want to have a nice curve. So adding these little edges through the flow here is going to allow me to tailor that bevel a little bit more. And so and after I have these, you see it's gone all the way through since that was a loop around that entire area. Now I can Q-mesh a single polygon on these, remove, remove, remove. And you see now I've created that door there. And if I turn that on, you see that's how it's kind of falling into my building. And now after I have this, if I activate dynamic subdivision, you're going to see it's giving me this effect. So not really what I'm looking for right now. But what I can do is I now apply creasing again to these different parts, and this is now going to instead give me this weird kind of push in. I can make it solidified. So I'm going to get out of dynamic again, and I'm going to go back to my edge action of crease, set it to just edge, and I'm just going to come through here and click these really quick, and I'm just creasing these edges individually. And I want to make sure I get all these areas through here. Uh, these would also probably crease pretty well if I did a uh, 
edge loop as well, but I just want to show you guys that you can do it manually too. And you'll notice I'm not creasing these areas in here. So I want those to retain that bend or that bevel. So when I turn dynamic on, you can see now I'm getting a round surface there. This is still too much through here. So I need to add another supporting edge loop along this area. So I can turn to the side of my model here. And I, since these two parts are broken now, basically through here, if I want to add a curve all the way through, I can use that slice curve brush again. Just come through, add that in there. It's going to add me a nice edge loop through there. Now if I activate dynamic, you see now I'm getting that nice little bevel kind of rounded corner there. And then I can control where this position of this loop is. So if I use masking, hold control and drag this out, I'm able to isolate or mask those points. And then I can click off to invert it. And then I use my Gizmo 3D and move. And I can move just those edges. And if I have dynamic on, as I move these, you're going to see the shape of that doorway is going to change, right? Because I'm just offsetting those edges. And if they're really close, I'm going to get a really strong edge. And if they're farther out, that's when I'm going to get that kind of nice soft curve. So I can just modify that topology there. And now I've got that looking like that. Now I can come through and I give this all one polygroup since I made a little mess with polygroups there. And then I'm going to rotate to this side and I want to add a window. Now the idea of this kind of area in the back of this thing here is going to be a bathroom. So I don't want this massive window. Um, I probably don't want it low. I want it kind of like middle or high. Uh, so I want to add some edge loops, supporting edge loops for this before I add a uh, window in here. Now to add a window, there is a option in the Zmodel brush if you hover over a point, and this is called split. And split has two targets, has a point and a ring target. And what this is going to allow you to do, if I come across a point and click and drag, I can split that point. And you can see it's going to split it into this nice circular format. So what I want to do is I want to make a edge cut in this area here so I can start putting this window in. So I can use the slice curve brush again and just slice through, which is going to give me that edge and hit control W to give me a new polygroup. And then now I can split this point and this is going to give me that window. Now, when I do things like this, like splitting these kind of surfaces, if you have two sides of your model, you want to make sure that you split them kind of simultaneously. And then also you want to come through and give this kind of um, shape here for the cylinder a secondary one with it. So you want to do this process twice. So I've applied this once to one side. I'm going to rotate around to the back wall because I want to make sure that both sides have this. I'm going to click just that point again. I'm not going to click and drag. I'm just clicking. And this is going to repeat that same process I just did with the split point on the other side. So if I click, this is now going to match. They're both the same size. And then I can come in and click again, and I want to add just a little one here. And the reason for doing this is it's going to give you a boundary line. So let's say after you've added this circle through here, maybe you want to bevel that circle out, maybe you want to make it larger or smaller. It gives you a buffer. And for any kind of circular stuff that I do for modeling assets, using Zmodel or even other uh, methods of modeling, I always do this kind of buffer effect because you never know. <laughs> if you make a circle, it's, it's kind of a big pain to remove the circle after you made it, especially if you want to do large changes. Um, so by adding this little buffer zone between there, it gives you a little more freedom um, in terms of what you can do. So I always recommend if you're going to make a hole, do it like a double hole like this. Because this outer topology, you can ignore it if you don't want to use it, but if it's there, you can have more options. And so after I have this, I now just want to select these inner portions. I'm going to hold down the Alt key and just highlight those with a temporary polygroup. You can see I already have the Q mesh action poly selected and you can see it's just single poly right now and if I click and drag I can poke through and that's going to punch that hole right out and then now if I turn on my dynamic subdivisions you can see I got a nice circular hole cut through the building there now one thing nice about having this with this kind of area in here with this kind of sparse topology around it is I can manipulate this now so if I put this hole in here and now I decide, ah, uh, maybe I want it offset or maybe I want it down lower. As long as I have, have enough space around here, what I can do is I can get that mask pen, I can hold control to drag it out and then use spacebar to move it. And I can just isolate those points there. So I've just masked those areas. And I can hold control and flip it. And now I can go back to my Gizmo 3D, center on it. it. Should give me the center unmasked mesh points there. And then now I can move this. And I'm just moving this within screen space. And this will allow me to reposition this window. And so you can see 
since I have this large area buffer, I can move this quite a bit. Now, if I go too far, you can see this is what would happen, right? So I'm getting this collision, I'm getting geometry on top of geometry, and you don't want that. So by keeping stuff sparse as you model too, and make, you wanna make holes and things like this, like you can see how much freedom I have to reposition this. And I can turn off my uh, perspective there and move this around, or dynamic and polyframes, and I can kind of position it and see where it goes. I can, you know, rotate the model, see how it's looking, it's pretty good for a little bathroom there. And then I clear my masking, and there I've got that nice hole. Now if you wanna get extremely complicated with this, now that you have this double loop, if I wanna add some more detailing, and come across this and do say an insert multi-edge loops, I can do a interactive elevation, and I can add you know this now to my model, right? So now it's got a ring. So if you wanna do something like that, you can definitely do that. I can pull that off like we did before with that pipe, and just, you can keep going with that. But if you didn't have that second ring of topology, you wouldn't be able to get those kind of effects. And so now I have that looking a little more interesting with that secondary thing there. And you can also do the same thing on the interior one too. So if I come across, say this one here, and multiple edge loops, I can now tailor this to maybe get a little different look out of that window too. So a lot of different things you can do with your shapes. So now that I got this mostly kind of flushed out in terms of this. And I wanna make some beams through here. And for those beams, I'm gonna go back to this inner part I made here. So this is gonna be a metal part. So when I, if I get to rendering it today, um, I'd want these to be a metal. So I want those to be have these metal divisions that are coming through and they're forming this kind of support structure in, in terms of the uh, area. And also would establish like a door area where if you had this and you need to get in and out of this thing, how would you do that? You'd probably open it through one of the sides. So I wanna add some supporting metal portions through that. So I'm gonna go into my uh, polyframes here and you see this is the shape right now. I've got an extra edge loop in here, so I'm just gonna come through and remove that, just holding Alt and clicking. And I'm just gonna remove that from all the sides here. Get rid of that there. And then now what I wanna do is I'm gonna make sure my creasing is good, so I'm gonna increase all, increase one more time. And now I wanna add some elements for those kind of support structures. And to do this, what I wanna do is I wanna add a cut and then add a cut next to it. So I have two areas and then I wanna Q mesh from top to bottom and that's gonna allow me to take those and then combine them together and I'm gonna get a straight line between those two parts. So I could come through and use that slice brush again, turn on my polyframes, slice and slice, right? But then now if I wanna do this same slice, the same distance over here, I'm eyeballing it. This is not so it, it would probably be close, but it's not gonna be the same distance here as it is here because I'm doing it twice. So instead of doing that, what I can do with my slice brush is as you draw it out, if you hold down, oh, before you draw it out, if you hold down control and shift and hold space bar, it's gonna pop up this little hidden menu in here, another hidden menu. And in here, there's an option called B radius. And what B radius is going to do, it's going to look at your brush radius and whatever it is, it's going to slice based around that. So if I click B radius to turn this on, and now if I do a slice, it's gonna look at my draw size, and it's going to give me a slice with that radius of that brush. So you can see as I sliced, it made two slices, okay? So if I have control and shift, spacebar, turn B radius off, slice without it, I'm only getting one. Control and shift, spacebar, B radius on, change your draw size to what you want, click and drag, now you can see it's giving me two. And so this way I can come through and slice there and slice there. And now these are the exact same between those two points. So those width of this here and the width of that there are identical. So now after I have those created and come over here to one of these, Q mesh of poly, drag this up, connect, drag this up, connect, drag this up, connect, and drag this up, connect. And now I've made that framing kind of structure through there. Uh, one question asking, can you hotkey the B radius before instead of calling the pop-up? Let's see, let's see. I don't think I've ever done that. Um, in the clip brush modifiers, B radius. So if you ever wanna find out where a button lives, hold down, uh, hover over it, and as you're doing it, uh, if you get this little help text that pops up, when you hold down control, you'll see it's gonna give you the button path. So this button path is clip brush modifiers B radius. So if we go to brush, clip brush modifiers, there's B radius right there. So you can definitely hotkey that and then toggle that on and off as needed. But the little hidden one is control shift and space. We'll bring that up. 
There's also unclip, which is a whole other thing as well, which you can clip a surface, add a detail, and then unclip it. And so if you have a round sphere, you can clip it, add your detail, unclip it, and then it will process the mesh and apply the detail back to it. It's a handy thing for spheres. All right, so I got my frame there, my frame there. I'm gonna check my, uh, my little image I did earlier because I can't fully remember where I positioned these. So I'm gonna move these some too. So to do this, I can just mask and then switch to the gizmo and then reposition them. And as long as I do them in X, Y, or Z, they're gonna line up correctly. So I can position this one, say there, and then I can move this one, position it here. So maybe something like that. So now I've got edging, I've got my little border around it, I've got my hole in my wall. Um, I just now need some little bit of furniture in here and then also a, some glass as well. So for the furniture stuff, uh, it's pretty much just gonna be another basic uh, Z modeler process here. So my bed, I kind of just have it as like extruded uh, cube basically. So I'm gonna pend over a poly mesh star and just select that. I'm gonna go down to the initialize menu way down here, do Q cube, and then turn on polyframes there. If you make something and it's your scene's getting really big, what you can do if it comes in really small is you can just come up here and go to deformation and do unify. And that's gonna make it a little bit bigger in your scene. So as I started modeling this, my scene started growing, but maybe I don't want it to be that large. And then I'm just placing my kind of object in here, just kind of see size-wise how this is gonna fit. And I wanna kind of go in the floor, so I'm not too, it can embed in the, uh, the box here. I just wanna make sure it's not sticking out. So there we go, we got something that's looking a little bit like a bed. This may be for very short people. There's not gonna be much walkway through there. This is a very tiny, tiny uh, bedroom here. Now after I have that shape kind of standardized uh, to my liking, I now come in and start modeling it. So I'm gonna insert a edge loop in here, single edge loop, add that. I want a little headrest through here. So I'm just gonna Q-mesh these two, pull that up a little bit. And then for the bottom as well, I wanna add a little effect too. So I'm gonna come through and grab all these and then use the inset option and do inset region and bring that in a little bit. And then I'm gonna Q-mesh polygroup island. Where are you at, polygroup island? Let's give it a little bit of a base. So you got something like that. And then I wanna apply, start messing with my creasing to get the rest of my shape. So if I just smooth it all, this is what I'm getting here. So you may like that rounded bed look there. I got a comment that my bathroom's too big. The bathroom's never too big. It's never too big. It could be larger. <laughs> uh, read another question here. So if you hold control and come across any of the stroke options, it should pop up um, and stay. So we had a question, it, when holding control over the stroke options to get some info, it disappears instantly. It should hold. Come over these, it should hold as well. Just make sure you're holding down control. Um, unless you're doing some other area where you're doing the stroke. Um, and changing the proportion of an alpha, uh, you can do it with, if you're dragging it out for like a mask, if you have a mask pen, there is a option for mask rectangle. Um, and this will allow you to, when you select this, you're gonna be able to change your stroke type. And so rectangle, if you don't have the center and square option on it, when you drag that out, you're gonna be able to drag it out like this. So if I have an alpha, say like this, I can drag it out in weird dimensions or shapes. Um, if you're using it in terms of say, let's get back to my, let's go standard brush. A drag rack is always gonna draw in a rectangle format. So no matter what you do with this, it's always gonna come out as a rectangle. Um, and you can't really change the stroke in there. Uh, you could modify the alpha in here with tiles, so you get more tiles basically in one way or the other. Um, but basically, if you have an alpha that's kind of a set size, um, it's gonna retain that size when you bring it in. Now you can always draw it out. There's a few tricks you can do 2.5D where you draw it out, you can then distort it, and then you can capture it back through this uh, alpha transfer uh, grab dock option here, or you can also do make modified alpha. So there's some little tricks you can do with that, but that's all 2.5D. Um, 
I need to work on this building some. But there is some ways you can do that in 2.5D, take the alpha and it'll draw it out on your canvas. I may have an asked ZBrush video on that. It's, it's an old, old, old trick. So you basically, you see your alpha and then you can use this 2.5D scale tool to manipulate it and then make modify alpha and it'll change it for you. Right above the alpha box, these options, these options. So yeah, you're not gonna be able to get any information on these through here, but these all live in the stroke palette up here. So if you wanna see what any of those are, come to the stroke palette up here and then hold control and cover over that. Yeah, because as soon as you hit control, your brush mode is switching. So it's going into pen mode, mask pen. So that is why if you try to hover over this and then you hold control, your brush is switching to the mask pen. And so it's hiding that menu there. But if you're over these menus and you hold them, it should allow you to see them. Uh, let's see what other questions I got here. So you decimation models, decimated models have the ability to be decimated with UVs. So if you go to Decimation Master, there's a keep UVs and a use polypaint. So we got a question. Can I use uh, textures from Z remesh models for decimated models? So yes, as long as UVs are the same and when you decimate, just make sure you have keep UVs on and those are retained and then you should be able to apply those processes there. All right, so back to the bed. So I'm gonna use creasing to kind of give this a little more shape. So I'm gonna turn dynamic on, this is what I'm getting. And then I'm gonna come in and I'm just gonna start creasing some of this. So I'm gonna go into the edge action of crease and do it just edge. This is gonna allow me to crease single edges. So I come through and crease all those there. And then I wanna crease these guys. So I don't wanna crease those guys. Let's see what it's doing. So now I've got a rounded bed like that. If I wanna round the other way, I can do this. And that's giving me this kind of shape. So this is what I went with in my original kind of concept. Uh, bed process here. And while I'm doing this, you can do it with dynamic on, but sometimes it's a little bit easier just to select the edges with it off. So I'll just crease like this quickly. And this I'm seeing is like a headboard. Not really anything that's soft or squishy. I can add some other things later on that. And somehow I lost my inset area here. So let's fix that. And then let's Q mesh that back out. And then let's crease these. And the creasing process is definitely always fun to mess with. And if you add different edge loops and see how this is really soft, if I come through and add a, say a sliced edge loop through here, Now I'm gonna get that different effect on the bed. And then I can also increase my subdivision up here to get a little bit smoother. And then if you ever have any sort of anomalies, you can definitely clean them up too. So I can use the collapse option with edge here, collapse those out. I'm just gonna smooth that kind of surface through there. And then I may need to crease this too. So a lot of different things. You can also model in separate stuff. So if stuff starts looking you know, not what you're looking for. Um, you can definitely always add another part to it, change it up. But there's a, uh, a really weird bed <laughs> that's in there. And then if I want to polygroup this, I can polygroup it by the angles again and then add more creasing to it. But we're gonna leave it right there for now. Um, it's not the, not the best bed in the world. Now we got a few more things I want to model in here. So appending shapes is another thing that's working, just works really well. You just do it all the time. You don't have to have everything in one sample tool. Uh, there's nothing to say that you can use, you can use as many subtools as you want. And oftentimes if you're working on any mesh, if you have stuff that's in multiple subtools, it's going to perform a little faster because basically um, when you're working on a model and if you do like a rotation process, uh, ZBrush is kind of caching your stuff to your drive. And so if you have a single model that's like 40 million polygons, when you go to rotate, if it has no subdivisions, nothing, it's going to be, you know, kind of chunky kind of rotating around. If you have that subtool broken up into multiple subtools, like different pieces and everything out, you're gonna get a little bit more performance out of it. So splitting a model up is definitely a good thing in terms of uh, navigation and things inside of ZBrush. You also have an option down here on this uh, 
I don't know if you guys can see it. On solo, there's a little dynamic option. And so if you're working with really heavy meshes, you can turn dynamic on. And when you rotate, it's gonna hide everything but the mesh you have selected. And then when you stop, it's gonna bring it all back. So if you ever have this happen, that's what's controlling it, it's this dynamic option. And this is to allow you to kind of work with really heavy models. And as you rotate, um, you can rotate freely. And then as you release, all your subtools will populate again back in the view. So I am allowed to use uh, Keyshot in the stream. I actually updated it before I uh, got this going. And uh, that was my plan. My plan was to uh, Keyshot some stuff for you guys too. <laughs> we may be going on to stream two for this because I didn't even get into array mesh yet and I've got about like 20 minutes left. <laughs> uh, so question about the uh, filleting stuff. So you have uh, options in uh, QMesh, which you can do it. Um, and then your bevel options that I showed earlier. If you hover over this and go to uh, the bevel area in here, you have some rows down here and sharpness you can change and this will kind of give you that kind of bevel effect you're looking for. Um, but after it's on there, you're not gonna be able to, be able to control it. So it's basically a destructive process. So when this happens, it's gonna be destructive. So if I come through here and do edge loop complete and then maybe do sharp edge, I may apply this. And then if I add the, is it the, We'll do four rows and it's gonna be set to sharp edge. When you do this, it's gonna space these edges out. You can see I've got two edges that are bumped really close to that and two edges that are bumped close to this and this is gonna give me a sharp edge. So when I turn dynamic on, you can see it's now sharp. If I undo that, I do that same process again and I do say soft edge, four rows soft edge, it's now gonna come through and try to soften that middle up and now I'm gonna end up with a softer one. So that's, you can come through and do that kind of process in there. You're not gonna be able to get a negative carve into your shape. Um, you can do it after you have topology. So if I come through and say, bevel this edge with two rows, we'll do single row, uh, linear edge. And then I come through and now do a edge loop, multiple edge loops. And then you have different options here for linear and things like that. And so this will allow you to go in or out. So if you wanted that kind of process, so you can get that inner curve like that. And that's just in the edge option. So those are your two options basically, but you want to, it's going to only do it basically around an edge loop. Um, so if you have clean edge loops on your model, you're going to be able to get that effect. And then if you dynamic it, just controlling your creasing is going to determine how that's going to render to. So right now, if I have no creasing here, you can see when I do this, I'm kind of getting like this kind of softness through there. If I don't want that to be soft, I can come through and add a crease, edge loop complete around that part, that part and this part. And now when I do it, it's, that edge is gonna be harsh and this is gonna be soft in the center. So that's how you can control that. Um, <clears throat> So I can show you here, I'll, let's see what we got here. So I was gonna model the bathroom and some other stuff. Um, the array mesh stuff, I don't know if I'm gonna get into because that's that actually takes a little bit. Um, but basically what I'd end up doing, quick recap, is model all this stuff in pieces. And a lot of Zmodeler usage would be all this. And then after having these in pieces, I'd come through and just name these uh, or give them a different polygroup coloring or a material coloring. So I know that I want the outside to be one color, I wanted these metal areas to be metal. So at this stage, I'd come through and just start selecting these parts and then applying a different material to it. So if I come over here and say, um, take this part that I have, which is this one here, and I want this to be kind of a light material. So these materials don't have to match, I just need to have a difference across my model. So I'm gonna set, say, the MacCap Metal of three. I'm gonna come up here to color. First, I wanna make sure I have material turned on, color, fill object, that's now gonna fill this subtool with that material, which is that metal 03. And I'm gonna go and select my outer shell here. I'm gonna select the, we'll do this one, say metal 04, make sure I have material on, color fill object. I'm gonna go to my bars, make sure there's no masking applied. And I'm just going down the list here, I just want them separate materials. And then we're gonna go color fill object and go to my, this one I want actually to be interior. So I'm gonna come through and just scale this down and just make it a little interior shell here because I want the inside walls different than the outside walls. So I'm just gonna Q-mesh the inner island there, pull that out. 
So let's just do this. And then we'll do a poly group, poly loop. A different material color there. Q mesh this out. I just want it to, I don't want it to be right on top of that other one, but I just want it pulled in some so I can set a different material to it and then scale this and hide it. Because I want to make sure my wire edges are looking okay, separated, and then they're separated from that interior panel. So I just placed another piece of geometry in there for that. And then I'll apply this different material color. So we'll do the red one for this color fill object. Then we have that one we don't need, and then we have the bed, and we'll do the bed as this color fill object. And then I can delete that. And so now I have all these kind of set up in different materials. Now, I did this because if I do an array mesh on this, what I'm gonna have to do is I'm gonna have to take all these parts and pretty much either merge them into one mesh or load the array mesh function into each part individually. So as a easy solution for this and short on time here now, um, I'm just going to come through and do a merge option here. And all my stuff right now is using the same dynamic subdivision. So I'm not concerned about having parts that are dynamic and having parts that are not dynamic. Everything is using dynamic. So if I merge all these dynamic parts together and I activate dynamic subdivision again, it's all going to look good. If you have parts that are subdivided, you have parts that may be uh, decimated, and you have parts that are using dynamic, if you merge those together and you then activate dynamic, some of your stuff may not look right because all those pieces weren't using dynamic when you merged them. So you want to keep your dynamic stuff together or turn it into geometry and then keep everything else in its own little category. But for this one, everything's good. So I'm just going to merge uh, visible here. And now I have a merged version of this that has uh, all those areas broken out. And if I activate dynamic, you can see it almost worked. My little posts weren't using dynamic. So I'm going to come and select those. Uh, if you just select part of a model and you want to select the rest of it, you can get control shift A and that'll allow you to get um, kind of like the island of geometry there. So I want to select this and control shift A and I shouldn't be getting this window. Hold on. Hold on. Let's fix it this way. I'm going to apply creasing. There we go. That looks better. And it also helps if you polygroup everything uh, before you do the merge. So just you can use the up and down arrows to quickly select through your parts. And then I'm just giving them all a different polygroup as well, just so they all have separation on that. And then now I can merge visible. Now I should have this version of it. Where did you go? This one here. And if I activate dynamic, things should look correct now. And I can increase my smooth subdivision to make stuff a little bit smoother. But there we've got that. And now you're gonna get a, a very quick array mesh option here. And so with this, my plan was to take this and end up you know, generating kind of a spiraling pillar of these kind of uh, processes. And I was gonna use the array mesh process to do this. Uh, with this, you have some presets. So if you have an object and you click this light box to array preset here, you can use these and the array mesh will allow you to take what it's just going to take whatever object you have and then it's going to apply this preset to it. So if you've used array mesh and you generate an array mesh set, you can save that out and then you can load another model and load that array mesh preset in and it's going to take that model and do the same thing to it. So if I wanted a quick, you know, like random spirally one off of this, I just have this mesh. It's just the sub tool I have. I've in the array mesh palette, I've opened up the light box area and now I can just click one of these. So let's say I'm gonna go with this one here and just double click. This is now gonna load that in. And if I close light box, you can see now I've got this, right? So now I've got this crazy array mesh version of this building. Now this probably isn't what you want here, but this little way of storing presets is handy because you can basically try out different things very quickly. And then if you use array mesh and set it up once, you can definitely reuse it. So don't feel like you have to use you know, ray mesh from scratch every single time. And so sometimes some of these may give you, you know, happy accidents or things you're kind of looking for. So not quite on that one. Let's see what this one's doing. That one's giving, that one's kind of a weird house one. Some people will be living upside down, but that's a good way to kind of experiment with it. Now, if you want to reset it and get back to where it is and just click the reset button here and you can go back to normal. And then with array mesh, what, you, what I usually end up doing is using it, you want to turn on like lock position, lock size, and make sure transpose is on. And then you want to come up here and activate move, scale, or rotate. Now when you activate move, scale, and rotate by default, 
This is gonna come in as the gizmo. And the gizmo 3D does not work with a ray mesh. So you wanna make sure that you switch the transpose line and that can be done by coming up here and clicking the gizmo 3D off. And now you're gonna get the transpose line. Now after you have the transpose line, if you click and drag, you're gonna be able to generate an arrayed or a duplicate version of your model. And this is gonna change these sliders down here automatically. So as I click and drag this, I can reposition this. So I can put it up in space here. Then I can change this repeat slider and this is gonna determine how many of these are gonna be processed. So if I come over here and just change this, you see I'm gonna get multiples of these generated on my form there. And then I can move these and rotate these and change how they're kind of functioning. So just taking that and offsetting it. Now you can also type in these sliders here. So if you wanna zero any of these out, may I want it to be at negative six and zero. Now it's perfectly straight in that vertical format like that. If I wanna add some rotation to it and come to the rotation area here and I can start changing these sliders. So if I wanna tip them upside down, I have that option. If I wanna just spin them around, I can do that. And that's gonna now give me this spin effect. So now I have these kind of stacked up. Now, of course, there'd need some sort of system to get these people into these rooms because there's no way uh, this is gonna, gonna work. <laughs> but now I have these all kind of set up like this. And then after we have this uh, kind of set, uh, this is all still working on that initial model. So if I turn off a ray mesh, this is my initial shape. If I turn it back on, this is what I'm getting. So if I modify this mesh down here in any way, all the other ones are gonna move with it. So if I switch to say the move brush here, and start moving these, you're gonna see that all those ones up there are also gonna distort. So it's doing an instance process and it's instancing across all of them. And then if you want it kind of repositioned, rotated, you can also change the pivot, which is gonna determine how much it kind of skews. You can also apply multiple rotation values to it. So you can tip things up or down, like if this was a really, really uh, kind of interesting hotel here, you'd have, you know, Maybe this room you get at an angle and it's cheaper because you're not gonna be sleeping straight. Um, so there's, there's all sorts of weird stuff you can do with a ray mesh. And then using the gizmo, you can kind of deform them like so. Uh, so we have one question here, can we align it on an edge? So you won't really be able to align it on an edge. It's gonna use its own positional data based on the uh, transpose line here. So wherever you manipulate it, it's gonna give you that kind of functionality. Uh, nano mesh, you can kind of use in a similar fashion and then that will allow you to line stuff to like polygons. So you can definitely use that instead. Um, there's also a bunch of other different options in the array mesh function. You can keep adding stages to it, which will repeat the stage you have and then add another stage onto it. Um, you can also determine when this pattern starts or stops. You can have it skip stuff. So if I want it to you know, start at say the second one, so it's gonna skip the first one. And then I can have the length be lower. So I can only get two of them, even though my repeat is set higher. So you can definitely come in here and change these sliders and you're gonna see the effect happen on the fly. So if I want a lot of crazy building stuff like that, this is good for kind of abstract art as well because it gives you some interesting kind of ideas and processes. But that's the, the quick, 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 quick rundown of a ray mesh. And we'll have to see about scheduling a, um, another uh, ZBrush Live room on this where I focus more on this stuff. And after you have these kind of things, you can save your file out. Always good to save. And then send it to Keyshot. And you just need to make sure you have the bridge installed and go to external render, enable uh, Keyshot. And then down here is a group by materials option. So this is one thing that if you have, or using a ray mesh and you have like these different parts, you probably want to set this up because it's going to break them out into these those materials that we set up. And so this is gonna allow me to drag a color on top and it's gonna populate the other items. So now I can send this using BPR and Keyshot should launch here. Now my Keyshot <laughs> did expire today. So we, we have NFRs here at Pixelogic for our Keyshot stuff. So I do have a little watermark on the bottom here. Now I've got it in the moonlight scenario. Let me fix my key shot here quick. Um, my environment came a little small for this one so I can adjust the uh, size of it. We don't want it being that tiny. And if I would have unified my scene, this would have helped too. And then in here, if I go to the scene area, I should have all these kind of parts broken up by those materials. So you can see the, we got the inner area, we got the, uh, area there we got the walls or the metal parts and we got the outer and then we got the bed and after i have these brought in what i can do is i can now start 
grabbing materials over here and applying them to those areas. So one things that are good for that I like using just to kind of test stuff are these um, paint options here and they've got some ones like this snowstorm and so I can come over and find which material if you have these named it's a little bit easier too. So I can come and say select the outer shell one there. I think it's this one. I'll apply that with snowstorm and this should now update on the mesh. I'm going to change my environment coloring here. And of course, I can't get down to the bottom. There we go. And so I can quickly come through and now apply different materials to these. And as they're updated, you'll see the name's gonna change. So a little bit easy way to kind of tell what you've changed. And you can use, you know, you know very contrasting colors to start with, just to kind of see. You just basically wanna separate all the materials. And then after it's separated, you can come in here and move and zoom. And this is also gonna render um, in using your CPU and it's gonna render kind of in real time. So the longer it runs, the clearer it's gonna get. And right now I'm only devoting 25% of my uh, processors to it. So that's why it's a little bit slow here because I have ZBrush running and I'm also streaming. Um, so it would end up being a little bit heavy. Uh, there's also the environments so you can come in here and add these. So there's some outdoor ones if I want this to be, get a little different lighting. And if you do things with glass and things like that, you're, pulling those HDR images are gonna end up getting you a nice um, kind of reflections. And if for glass, what I'd end up doing is I'd end up uh, rendering just another sub tool uh, that basically had a glass object in it and then make that in Keyshot here, have it just set as glass. And then that would give me a nice translucent effect across that surface. So I'm checking these questions here. So when you're using the bridge, the bridge is always gonna be pretty much be one way. Um, so it's gonna send and it's gonna send two key shots. Um, in that session of ZBrush, you should be able to send back and forth. But after that, you're not gonna be able to like resend. Because basically um, the information that's sent to key shot is stored in a uh, cache file in your uh, ZBrush data folder. Um, and if anything changes between those, it's not gonna be able to keep that thing in there. So what I recommend is if you're doing it, just remember it's always gonna go one way, it's not a two-way bridge. Um, and so it's sending two key shots. And so when it does that, if key shot's still running, it will update. But if you've closed key shot, you've closed ZBrush, then that link is uh, not gonna be there anymore. So that's one, one little thing there with it. And then what I do too, if you've gone through and set up a lot of materials inside of key shot, say you've set up labels and other things like that, Basically what you can do is just save these materials. So if I've came through and I've edited this snowstorm material um, and say I have UVs on my model inside of ZBrush, I had, you know, the position is pretty much the same um, and I have to close it down or I have to restart something on my computer. So just save that material out inside of Keyshot and Keyshot's gonna remember that data. So then when you send that same model again into ZBrush, that link won't be there. But what you can do is just take that material now and drag it on and it's gonna just return. Um, so if you've set up a really complex name, save all your materials out. Also, when you save anything in kind of Keyshot, uh, make sure you use the save package option. Because um, if you do save as, it's gonna look at these kind of texture files and things wherever they exist on your computer. So if you delete them, it, it's not gonna be there anymore. So using the uh, save package, package function is gonna take everything and kind of compress it and zip it up. And then when you open that package, you're gonna make sure you have all those individual parts and your materials and your HDRs and the mesh that you need so you can get back to that render. Um, there's been a few times where I've done a render for say marketing purposes and then I need to go change something and I saved it as not as a package and then I found out that I deleted a lot of stuff on my desktop that I was using and linking to it. So I had to recreate a bunch of stuff on that. So just be careful on that as well. Um, for the export to OBJ and import stuff, if you're using the ZBrush to Keyshot version, you will only be able to send objects to Keyshot using the bridge inside of ZBrush. Um, so if you have the, uh, the import option will not work if you're using the ZBrush to Keyshot version. So just one little thing there. If you're using the professional version of Keyshot, you'll be able to import in those files. But the one caveat with the version of ZBrush that we partnered, or version of Keyshot that we partnered with Luxion with, is that in order to get it to that kind of price that's you know extremely uh, cheap compared to the uh, professional version, is that the users have to use ZBrush and the bridge to get it to uh, Keyshot. But you can import in your OBJs and stuff into ZBrush and then send them to Keyshot using the bridge that way. 
So that is looking like I am out of time today. So I'll see about scheduling another thing with uh, building stuff because I do have some other tricks for building as well. Um, I do some of those, but we had a lot of questions here and so I'm happy to answer your guys' questions because I know that's one of the main reasons why you come here and, and I, I like doing it. So, But it often puts me off tangent so we didn't get to the array mesh today. Um, so hopefully you guys got some knowledge if it may not have been the exact stuff I was planning on doing. But that is it. Uh, to quickly recap, uh, once again, we have a trial of ZBrush 2020, which is available. So if you have anyone that is looking to try ZBrush, then definitely download it for free for 30 days. Also with this, if you go to ZBrush Central, let me find my thing here, and you are a current license holder of ZBrush, and you're using subscription, um, or if you're using subscription, the 2020.1.4 version is available. So if you've had any problems and say ZBrush has been crashing, we had some reports that it was related to licensing. So we've done a fix for that and it is the 2020.1.4 version. So if you are a license holder or a subscription holder of ZBrush, just go over to ZBrush Central and then just click on this, uh, it'll be in this top link right here. And this will show you where to go for that to grab that latest version and that should hopefully resolve some of those issues that we had some reports on. So I think that is it. Thank you all for coming out. I'll be back next Wednesday at the same time here for some more streaming, streaming, streaming. Uh, we have some other streamers coming this week for us. So Saul should be on tomorrow and then Paul is Friday. And then Daisuke will go on the early morning Japan time on Monday. And then also, if you guys have not seen the ZBrush Master stuff, so yesterday uh, we had Ben Morrow who went, um, and so another excellent ZBrush artist, and so he did a whole ZBrush Master stream on that. You can come over to the ZBrushLive.com page and click on Calendar, and then if you go to Calendar, and then go to, let's see if my internet is working here. Go to calendar and then go to June the 2nd. In here you'll find the link to the ZBrush Masters for Ben. And in here you'll find the information for the trailer here. And then there should also, maybe I have an older link here. There should also be a link here that will take you directly to our YouTube page for that um, restream as well. And if you want to catch on any of the other stuff that we do, all the stuff we do here on uh, our Twitch channel is all recorded. So basically what that means is you can rewatch this. So if you don't catch it live or you miss part of the start of it, you can just go to our YouTube channel, which is just uh, ZBrush at Pixel Logic. Or... So we hop over here quick. And then in here, if you go to videos, you can see and catch up on all the ZBrush Masters settings there. We have season one and then season two. And there is the uh, Ben's uh, ZBrush Master there from yesterday. And then in addition to that, you can catch all the other latest streams. So the last one I did was uh, six days ago on uh, the Proco model. So we did the 3D printing version of that. So if you're still excited and you still wanna watch more or hear my voice for a longer period of time, you can definitely find it on our YouTube channel as well. And then we also have all our other great streamers that are coming on. Uh, Ashley Adams usually goes after me. I don't think she's going today. Um, the next streamer we have coming up, let's go back to our calendar here. You can sign up for notifications on the calendar too, which is nice. So tomorrow we got Solomon and then Eamon and then Oscar will be going. Eamon's been doing some really cool toy stuff and design too, definitely product stuff. So definitely catch out, check out his stream too. But that is it for today. So thank you all for showing up. Hope you learned something and uh, be safe and keep ZBrushing. Happy ZBrushing. And I will see you all next week. So thanks again. Take care. <laughs>